WCBI News at 6 starts now. Good evening, everyone. A man accused of killing his mom on Mother's Day weekend claims he was under the influence. That's just one piece of information we learned at a bond hearing this afternoon. WCBI's Allie Martin has more on it. Antonio Gladney walked handcuffed and shackled from a Lee County Sheriff's Patrol unit into Justice Court. During the bond hearing, Justice Court Judge Chuck Hopkins reminded Gladney that he did not have to say anything. The hearing was only to get a bond set. But Antonio Gladney said he wanted the chance to get out on bond to make things right with his family. The 35-year-old said he was not in his right mind when he went to his mother's house on County Road 54 in Shannon this past weekend. And you heard firsthand without any prompting and after his rights had been read what his uh, basically initial appearance confession was before the judge uh, that he took responsibility for it. Uh, he worked act, you know, this act was solely his responsibility and he wanted to do what he could uh, do to make it right. But, you know, this is the... Uh, I don't know how many times he's been before a judge, uh, and I wished he'd have made it right before it cost the life of someone. Sheriff Johnson was referring to Antonio Gladney's lengthy criminal record. Since the age of 20, he's been in prison on felony charges, including strong armed robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, grand larceny, receiving stolen property, fleeing a law enforcement officer, and parole violation. Still, he's been released early on several occasions. Gladney's bond was set at $5 million, and the sheriff says the charges could change. We're looking into seeing if there was anything uh, taken from the house. Uh, if it was, then this act could have possibly been done in the commission of another crime of murder, uh, and that would make it a, a capital offense. Although he was talkative during the hearing, Gladney did not have anything to say on his way out of justice court. So you're under the influence of drugs when this happened? The case will go before the next grand jury. In Tupelo, I'm Allie Martin, WCBI News. And a condition of Gladney's bomb will require him to wear a GPS ankle bracelet. Shock and sadness across the state today after the body of a six-year-old boy is found in a car that thieves stole this morning. Many of you received the Amber Alerts on your phone about Kingston Frazier. He was inside the car when it was stolen outside of Kroger on Interstate 55 in Jackson about 2 o'clock this morning. Hines County deputies say the child's mother left the car running with Kingston inside. He was found around 10.30 a.m. inside the car with a gunshot wound. 18 year olds Dewan Wakefield and D. Allen Washington, along with Byron McBride Jr., will, will all be charged with capital murder. Meanwhile, the family is heartbroken. He's gone. Man, this is the, the, the worst thing to wake up to. We've been looking for him for nine hours. We've ridden every neighborhood in Jackson. We've been out there on back roads behind bushes. We've been everywhere. He was there. Kingston would have graduated kindergarten today. Time now to turn our attention to weather. And Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson has your first look. Joey, we've had some afternoon showers and thunder showers around the area today. A pretty good storm in Lamar County. This was just about 5 o'clock. That leading edge, that shelf cloud right there with some gusty wind and some very heavy downpours near Millport. That storm now, northeast of Sullivan, it will rain itself out here as we go throughout the evening hours. Also, a few blips here as we get into Lee County there. Southeast and northwest of Tupelo. That's just about it. What we have is going to fade away here shortly as we go throughout the next couple of hours. And by later this evening, a muggy night, a steam bath. We're in the 70s after sunset. The full forecast in just a few minutes. Thanks a lot, Keith. The municipal general election is quickly approaching. Ward 3 city council candidates in Columbus were invited to speak to the Exchange Club today. Yeah, a family emergency kept Charlotte Verdell from attending, but incumbent Charlie Fox was on hand. So was our Victoria Bailey. She joins us live in the studio with more. Victoria. 
That's right, guys. May 15th, the day before runoff elections, Ward 3 Councilman Charlie Box released campaign letters to residents of his ward. The letters were to encourage voters to help maintain the current racial makeup of the council by getting out to the polls to vote. Now, some were offended by the language used in the letters, but Box says he doesn't understand why. We need a council that represents the whole city. Charlie Box says he wants to get back to focusing on the campaign. I've been working very hard in this campaign. I, I don't know a whole lot about my opponent, and I've been running this campaign like I've been two touchdowns behind the whole time. Box says it wasn't designed to offend, but rather just state a fact. I stand by the fact that we need a racial balance on the city council. Simply this, we need, I said it's four and two now, four blacks and two whites. We do not need a six black city council, nor do we need a six white city council. Columbus needs diversity. Box says the letter originated from low voter turnout at the polls. And I did that. Uh, based primarily on the fact of the low voter turnout in the, in the uh, a pri primary election. And I felt like that I needed to encourage, uh, you know, my base to get out and vote. And so I sent letters out and asked them to go vote on June the 6th, and that's simply what it was. Box says the letters won't impact his campaign at all. I've had so much positive comment from from my white supporters. I've had support from my black supporters. Uh, very, very little negative comment to me. And uh, if people disagree, we're just going to have to disagree because that's, that's what I think. General elections will take place June 6th. Andrea? All right, the Starkville mayoral race is, and its results are still in question for one candidate. The Starkville Election Commission signed off on the results this afternoon. Officially, Lynn Sproul has won the race, but not before a bit of a dispute. Johnny Moore's attorney, William Starks, has asked for a courtesy recount. That request was denied. The committee says no challenges or recounts can be done until after the results are officially certified. There can be no examination of the ballots until the results are certified. Then if anyone wants to mount a challenge to the results, they can file a challenge and perhaps those ballots will then be examined. At this stage that we're going to have to do a ballot box examination, uh, that'll be the next step and determine whether we're going to do a contest. According to the Secretary of State's office, at any time within 12 calendar days after the certification of the election by the Election Commission, any candidate has the right to examine the ballot boxes and their contents. Well, most police chiefs are appointed by city leaders, but about 10 of them are elected. That's the case in Amory. Our Jory Talley joins us in the studio with more on elected police chiefs. Jory? Andrea and Joey, voters choose their leaders, but most don't have a say in who leads their police department. The job never stops for a police chief, especially for the ones who campaign during election season. Elected police chiefs go through the same process as other running candidates, but Amory Police Chief Ronnie Bowen says there's a lot more on the line. This is our livelihood. This is how we make our living and support our family. So it's a lot different running uh, for your livelihood than it is running for a part-time position or part-time job. Bowen first ran for office back in 1993, along with 18 other chiefs across the state. That number has slowly dwindled over the years as more cities choose to appoint their chiefs. Sometimes it's a power struggle. You have a, someone that may be in the mayor's position that wants to call all the shots in the police department or the fire department or any other department in the city. Well, that's what the managers of those departments are for, the police chief, the fire chief, the utilities manager. That's their job, is to manage that department. Bowen thinks being elected is the right way to go, and believes voters should have a lot more input than they do. It's a little hypocritical to tell the public they're smart enough to elect their alderman and their mayor, but they're not smart enough to elect their police chief. They're smart enough to elect the top law enforcement officer of the county, which is the sheriff, uh, and, but yet you're not smart enough to elect your own police chief in your local community. Lifelong Amory resident Gracie Freeman and new resident Caitlin Williams agree. With the board picket, I mean, you may not agree with that person, but if you choose it yourself, then you know what you be like that. 
and the president you'll be elected. Where I grew up, we didn't vote for it. And I, since we've moved here and I see everyone voting for it, I think it's a really good idea that the people actually have a say in who is actually over the law enforcement. Bowen's seventh term will begin in July. Andre and Joey. Story. Thanks a lot. Bulldog fans bid farewell to a baseball tradition this weekend. We head to Duty Noble for a live report when we come back. All right, we're back, everybody. It's the end of an era at Mississippi State. After 47 years, Left Field Lounge, as Bulldog fans know it, will be changing. Yeah, our Selena Schaefer is hanging out in Left Field with more on what's in store. Good. That's right. Alumni and fans alike have seen generations grow up in these outfields. And other generations of families have seen people grow up on these trailer parks and share decades of memories as well. We have contraptions built from scrap metal that were used to tailgate on the big games. Next year, an entirely new setup will be in place. The homemade spots will be replaced with outfield spots that will be built permanently into place. Many of the fans we talk to are sad about the upcoming changes and say, it will never be the same. I think from foul pole to foul pole, everybody's disappointed that it's going away like it is. Some people will like it because it's less trouble for them to get their rigs in and out. And But, you know, we'll adapt. We'll adapt and, and move forward because that ship has sailed and nothing we can really do about it. Everybody's kind of sad about it because we all kind of, Grew up together out here. You know, all of our kids and our, and our grandkids have been out here and, and played behind these trailers and where well, we could watch them. Last home series games here at Mississippi State's campus, and they expect ooh, about 30,000 fans to show up by the end of the weekend. Reporting in Starkville, Selena Schaefer, WCBI News. Weather is looking pretty good in Starkville. It's a steam bath out there. Some showers passing just east of Tupelo right now. A live look with our Alpha Insurance Camera Network. And basically the rain off the east of the Natchez Trace Parkway. We'll show you that and talk about your full forecast after the break. Your first alert weather forecast with Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson. Sunshine, clouds, a storm, a passing downpour, more sun, another shower. That's the story today. You can see this with our Alpha Insurance time lapse from Tupelo, some sunshine, and then some pretty good rain, and then we broke out into some additional sunshine. It's a steam bath out there. Uh, one of these thunderstorms today over here in Millport, Alabama. Check out this tree that fell on down. A little bit of gusty wind. This is from Charles White, the Millport police chief there. And that was the strongest storm we had, southeastern Lamar County. That system now is well to the northeast of Beaverton here in parts of Marion County, Alabama. That actually did produce a little bit of small hail, at least reported confirmed in Winfield, Alabama. And we had some suspected hail in southeastern Lamar County with some of that activity earlier. No confirmation on that, but uh, we still have a little bit of rain just moving through Tupelo now on the east side of town, northeast side of town, and up to the north and west of Guntown. So that's what we have. Earlier this morning, 9 o'clock, we were just seeing signs of these showers developing. And for the most part, this activity blossomed with this moisture that came on in, but it really stayed along and southeast of the Natchez Trace Parkway. You can see how it flared on up, and as we are losing the daytime heating, a lot of this stuff is going away. And nothing out west. Nothing. 
Yeah, southeast of the Natchez Trace, we have more clouds and some spots well over an inch of rain with some of those downpours earlier today. Temperatures range from the upper 70s to the mid 80s right now, and the dew point value is very, very high. The higher those numbers, the soupier the air is, and it's going to be a very sticky night. 68 degrees tonight, warm and humid, light winds. Now, tomorrow we stay steamy. Temperatures will warm into the mid to upper 80s again, and much like today, some passing showers and thunder showers with some locally heavy downpours. No severe weather expected tomorrow. That's certainly good news. Big time storms erupting in the high plains. Tornadoes reported today, wind and hail as well. That system will give us a better chance for rain this weekend, but it's going to weaken before it gets here. So, our severe weather threat this weekend as that system rolls on in, uh, fairly low at this point. Point. Now, tomorrow afternoon, we may see some passing showers and thunder showers. Same story on Saturday, too, but probably more numerous activity by Saturday afternoon and evening into Saturday night and Sunday with that front that will sweep on in here. So that's the way it's looking. Here's our seven day. Some elevated rain chances for the next couple of days. Pretty warm and steamy through Saturday. A little bit cooler by Sunday with that elevated rain chance. Another system by Tuesday, drier by the middle of next week. There's your forecast. More after the break. WCDI Sports with Tom Ebel is brought to you by your local Ford dealers. Go further. A chance to take home a title. Game two of the baseball state championships happening today in Pearl. And three of our area teams have a chance to seal the deal. In 6A, the, two, the Tupelo Golden Wave needing one more game to bring home that title. Hit a heck of a game last night. Let's see if this one could top it. Top first we go. Or wait a minute. There's, this is Corinth. All right, here we go. So we'll change it up. So this is 4A. Corinth here, fifth inning. Corinth trails six to one here. So here comes the rally. Here comes the Warriors. Bases loaded. It would be Kyle Kriggers coming through in the clutch. Spencer Lee scores. Here comes Knight all the way from first. It'd be a Krigger triple. So it'd be now four, six to four. But Corinth wasn't done just yet. This is all in the top of the fifth. Baylor, Baylor Frazier. He's going to line one up the middle. It's mishandled. That's going to give time. For Kerrigan Manies and Will Agnew to score, so a six run fifth gives Corinth a seven to six lead. But West Lauderdale hits right back. They'd have a four run bottom of the fifth. This a two run RBI for the Knights. So West Lauderdale, they come away with the 11 to seven victory. That would force a game three. That'll be coming up with a game three decider coming up on Saturday, Saturday at 1 p.m. 6A we go, here we go. Golden Tupelo Wave, they need one more win to bring home a state title. Last night was wild. Let's see if they could top this one. Here in the first, Wave strike first. Josh Smith lays down the squeeze bunt. Airmail throw to first. That's going to bring home Nick Ratliff. So Smith would get to second. Tupelo, they're up one to nothing. Charlie Greer, here he's on the mound for Tupelo. He'd get some help from his friends. Look at Smith in the outfield flashing the leather. That's a heck of a play to get the Wave out of the inning unscathed. More from Tupelo's D. Gatlin Farah starts the double play on his own. Beautiful play there. Tupelo's defense working. They'd be trailing 3-1 to one, heading to the top of the six. But then Tupelo never say die. It's Farah. Comes through with a liner down the left field line. That's going to bring home a run. So it's 3-2. to two, Tupelo trailing. They're going to battle back on a wild pitch. It'd be Clay Cox from third. He's going to score. So it's 3-3. Three to three, And just like last night, it's a tie ball game. We're still, this game is still going on. At last check, we're heading to the ninth inning. It's three to three. So Tupelo and Gulfport in another classic. We'll be recapping this one later tonight on WCBI Sports once we actually get a final. So then to the NCAA softball tournament. Oxford, they're hosting a regional for the first time ever. The SEC champion Ole Miss Rebels back to work preparing for its regional game against Southern Illinois tomorrow. A dream come true for the Ole Miss team that will begin its road to Omaha in Oklahoma City, I should say, in the friendly confines of Oxford. So coming up tonight on WCBI Sports, we'll be recapping Ole Miss softball as well as Mississippi State baseball. Heck of a sportscast coming up later. Make sure you stay tuned. Last look coming up next. Just a few showers Yeah, out that'll there. go away this evening. All right. Thanks for joining us.